Hello again everyone, welcome back to another episode of Karukan opening series where we talk about openings in depth and try to recognize all the patterns and structure so we can apply those things into our games as well regardless of which color we're playing with. And so pretty much on the last couple of episodes we've talked about white side playing knight to c3 in this position with black taking on e4. This is known as one of the more common lines, more open lines for white to play. But what if white does not do knight c3 at all? What if he just pushed the pawn to e5 and closed down the position? This type of Karokan is known as an advanced variation of Karokan where white pushes on e5 and closes down the center of the board. With this e5 move, white is actually trying to create chances for him to control more center or more space on the board while limiting some of the mobility that black will always have. Just for example, the square here on d5 is no longer available for the knight to jump in, where it might be available if we have taken the pawn on e4. This kind of line will be somewhat more complex than the previous videos that we saw, but the principles will always stay the same in that black will always try to control the light square diagonal and just in general the light square complex around the king side, the queen side and everywhere on the board and try to attack, I'm sorry about that, try to attack on the queen side. And so the move here to play is bishop to f5, trying to get the bishop out of the pawn chain before playing pawn to e6, trying to just solidify the pawn structure that we have. In this position, there are more than few lines that what could have tried to go for the position. What could have tried knight to c3 in this position again, what could have tried bishop g2, knight to f3, pawn to h4, all have been tried. But for the simplicity's sake, let's just say what plays bishop to e2. One of the more common lines that we will see in this variation, where white perhaps might not be looking for something special right away, he is going to develop with knight to f3, again pawn h4 is possible, but in this position rather, white is really looking to outplay black in terms of positional understanding and positional play, and he's basically ready to go into a long grind that can potentially put black's player to sleep in this position because it's just so difficult and it's so complex to defend. But in this position, there are myriad possibilities for black as well, Black could go for knight to d7, black could have gone for knight to e7, he could go pawn to c5 trying to break down the center of the board, he then could have also played pawn to a5, where it's just pretty initial move to attack on a queen side. Now if the continuation were that simple, perhaps this video would have ended in some 1-2 minutes, but surely you have to apply some position or understanding into your game as well. Because obviously you can do a lot of things in this position, but if you get checkmate on the king side, perhaps it's just not going to be very nice. Now today in this video, we're just going to talk about a continuation of pawn to c5 where it really forces white to do something over here, trying to wreck the structure on the center of the board. And if white were to take, then suddenly we're just developing two pieces onto the center of the board. This double bishop pair is now out, attacking the weakest pawn on the board, which is c2 and also f2 in this position. Now I refer to them as weakest pawn on the board because they are often only protected by the king and the queen in the initial part of the game. But in any case, pawn takes on c5 is not what white is looking to do here. And so they just mainline for white to just protect this pawn here by bishop to e3 or pawn to c3. Now also in this video, we'll be talking about bishop to e3, where it's more common to see rather than pawn to c3. That will come in another video. But the point of course is to take on c5 with the protection of bishop on e3. And so straight after the bishop is left from the post on c1, we're just going to bring our queen to b6. To attack the pawn on b2 and white really wouldn't want to play pawn to b3 in this position because black would have just played knight to c6 we're actually just trying to put pressure on the center of the board preparing to capture on the center of the board but if anything getting ready to cast on the queen side so you can get the king into safety again it's still impossible for white to take on c5 because bishop takes c5 we're just developing in one move this bishop now is actually on the center of the board trying to exchange off some of the more active pieces on the board which is the bishop on e3 and so let's just say white castles on the king's side and suddenly we can just take on d4 with this kind of position with bishop to c5 we exchange off white's active pieces we develop our piece to c5 later on if possible we can just go knight to e7 prepare the castle on the king's side as well and if the bishop were to take on c5 then suddenly we can have attack on c2 as you can see our queen and bishop is attacking the c2 square and let's say if we place pawn to c4 they can quickly develop my knight to e7 where after it takes on d5 you can just get on knight to d5 where it really helps our development of pieces what makes a lot of pawn move to actually get rid of the weaknesses we will actually try to develop our pieces to the center of the board and so it seems like a good trade seems like a very good prospect for black even if white were to play bishop to d3 right here we can just play knight to d7 the same kind of concept we're just trying to develop our pieces trying to cast on the king's side and if it continues like this bishop to f5 knight to f5 needless to say black is just one move away to cast on the king's side 
but also have a very equal and nice position where Black's piece is already out, while White's piece is still stuck on the first rank. And so in general, this will be a very good position for Black to play. And so way back in this position, White wouldn't want to play pawn to b3, just to protect his pawn. And so in this position, main line for White is actually knight to c3, where it sacrifices the pawn on b2. And so right away, you can already see the position is really filled with dynamic imbalances, where Black's already creating chaos on the queen side. And so that's why I think the line with pawn to c5, directly challenging the center of the board, is always a better approach for Black to play against a higher rated opponent, because we're just not letting White outplay us in a close position, we're just going to throw punches as well, as quickly as possible. Now Black in this position will play knight to c6 instead of taking on b2, due to the very same principles on the video on top right here as you can see. The third principle of the video explains that we actually have to castle to get our king to safety before committing to anything crazy, whether that's changing the structure, whether that's actually taking the pawn on opponent's queen side, so feel free to check that out as well. But the point is, White still cannot play pawn to b3 in this position because of the very same reason that we talked about just now, where the bishop just developed to c5 very quickly. And after the exchange, let's say on c5, we're attacking the knight on c3, but along with that is the pawn on c2. So White in this case will continue with castle on the king's side, and in this position, we'll just take the pawn on b2. Now, Black here is up a pawn, but no one can assume that this position is already winning for Black due to the fact there's always a counterplay on the b file. But one thing is clear, white in this position does not have queen to b1. Well, if white traded off, we can still castle on the queen side of the board and try to prevent white from infiltrating on our queen side. And so this is the advantage of bringing a knight out early in the game, so we can castle quickly in the queen side whenever there's a problem on our queen side. Especially with the open b file right here, there's always a problem. And if white plays rook to b1 here, we just take on c3. Suddenly we just up a piece, rook to b7, infiltrating on the queen side. This rook does nothing on the queen side. If a piece on b7 is actually a queen, Instead of a rook, then it will be scarier because it attacks the rook, it attacks the knight. But the rook on b7 is mildly lethal, so we can just ignore this. We can just even play pawn to c4, I don't know, rook to c8 in this position to protect the knight. Lots of stuff. This rook here on b7 is actually very useless at the moment. But the main line for white goes queen to e1. And the threat is clear, by the way. If black has to play something like pawn to h5 as a pass move, the threat is rook to b1, trapping the queen on b5. And if the queen were to move to a3, let's say there's knight to b5 ready, trying to fork the king and the rook here on c7, this would be a bad position for black to play. Not to mention the queen here is already forked. If the queen moved to a5 or a6, let's say, knight to c7, it's a check no matter what. Forking the king and the rook, this would be a bad position to play. Alright, so with the background knowledge out of the way, I really want to focus on the main line. If you have reached this point by watching from the start, when you've understand the background knowledge, well, I reminded you to check the timestamp. But in general, it's very difficult to get a grasp on what my general audience have understood. And so I included some background information about what to do and what to avoid in some situation, right? And so I'll really appreciate it if you can click the like button. But alright, let's get to our main focus. So we mentioned this position in the first part of the video that White really wants to play Rook to b1 in this position. Try to get a counterplay on the b file. The plan is also Knight to b5, where it tries to fork the King and the Rook on the corner of the board. And so really, what does White do right in this position? It turns out the key move is actually to break the center with the pawn that we pushed to c5 not long ago. And that is by the move pawn takes d4. The pawn taking on d4 looks to release the long diagonal for the bishop to roam about so they can really participate in the attack. As you've probably noticed, Karokan is always about these two snipers getting into the position and having a lot of play in the first part of the game. And if what recaptures to the bishop, we're just going to recapture and play bishop to b4. This directly hits the knight through the queen. And certainly I've got to mention as well, if knight had taken on d4, we do not want to take that knight on d4 and puck the bishop on d4, protecting the knight on c3. That way when the bishop comes to b4, there'll actually be no attack on the white knight because it's clearly protected by two pieces. Instead, if the knight had come to d4 to recapture the pawn, we simply go bishop to b4. That way we put the same stress that we talked about just now, which is pinning down a knight to the queen. Of course, white cannot play bishop d2 because the knight is hanging. But let's just say he took it to bishop, and after the recapture, he will play bishop to b4. The main line for white is actually to play rook to b1. This one, of course, skewers the queen directly to the bishop. And so if you play something like queen to a3, for example, this, of course, will be awkward because rook to b3, this will then attack the queen and the bishop, putting us in a really awkward position right here. This rook protects the knight as well, so... Queen a3 may not be the correct choice right here. Instead, the main line has chosen bishop take c3, just taking the knight away. The rook can take the queen, but after we take the queen here on e1, we do see after pawn to b6, we're just up a pawn simply in this position. Black has a very solid pawn structure, very solid king, 
and even with bishop to b5, king to f8, it is very okay for us not to castle because our king is just so safe tucking on a king side right here. Of course, the next plan will be knight to e7, try to get our king to g7 or h7, try to get our rook out as well. And so really, in the eyes of many, this position or this main line may seem like it really offers no advantage to play. In fact, in the first 10-15 moves, we've already seen our queen being traded off. A lot of our minor pieces have already come out as well. And so if you're in a game, perhaps this position is not really a favorable main line to go to. But imagine a scenario, right, where you're in a tournament and you only need a half a point to actually clinch the tournament and win that bad boy trophy back home. And you're playing as black. You don't really want to play Sicilian defense where there are really chances for white to break through to your defense. So you'll play this line where it offers you a pawn advantage and also a very solid position for your king in which it's very difficult to find a breakthrough unless you blunder a piece. But let's say you're in a position when you want to play against a higher rated opponent and your opponent seems to know everything about a theory and you just want to have a solid endgame where you don't have complications. I think this line can still benefit many. But just imagine, right, if you're in a tournament and you just really need a draw to stop the bleeding because you've just had such a bad first two rounds, first three rounds, for example, and coming onto the fourth round, you just want to have a very chill game a very quick end game where it just falls down to a very drawish position. Again, I still think that this kind of position is fine to go to and can still benefit many. Of course, if you're in a position where you need a win and you want to win, of course, this line is really not suitable to play because I believe this kind of line has actually been gone through many, many times and is known inside out. And so really, it will be difficult to find a win for black in this position. But with that said, black is actually very okay. In fact, after knight to f5, and pawn to f5, where we usually play pawn to c4, just getting rid of the last weak pawn that he has in a position, so there won't be a target down the line. And after something like take and take, here comes another critical moment where we have to play pawn to g5, due to a couple of things. The first one is really want to get the rook out to the 6th rank right here via rook h6, along to the 6th rank. The second one, we also want to prevent pawn to f4, and so if he had moved to f4 in his position, we can just capture the pawn straight away. With the pawn not being on g5 in the next move, or say if the pawn were on g6, there is no possible way the rook can get in. There's no possible way the rook can get into the 6th rank. Also not possible to take on f4 straight away as well. In fact, if white played pawn to f4 in this position, this will solidify the pawn on e5, and this will be the kind of advantage that white is looking for. And so if we can just prevent that kind of advantage with pawn to g5, I think it will be very good for us to play. But with that said, also this position is really difficult to lose for black, as there are not many pieces left for white to actually generate counterplay against the black king here on f8. I can even tell you the plan to actually just go for a very quick draw right here from black, and it's really to just trade off the first pair of the rook and slowly trade off the second pair of the rook, where you're left with one minor pieces. In fact, let's just play a couple of sample lines. Let's say white plays rook to e2 in this position, try to push the champion, which is the e5 pawn right here, try to create an opening, we can just play rook to e8, an active defense, let's say pawn to e6, we just capture, develop a knight to h6, you know, and let's say white plays a waiting move, we can just play king to g7, get that rook to f8. And let's say if the bishop move, we can just trade off the rook. Well, let's put down the board again, bishop to b3 right here. We see rook to e2, rook to e2, rook to f8. And so the active attack here will be rook to e7. Try to check the king, also taking the pawn on a7. In this position, you can even just play king to g6, even after rook to e7 right here, rook to f6. It is very difficult to imagine black losing his position. White has one pawn, black has one pawn on the queen side, this pawn is never getting anywhere. Park everything on a dark square so the bishop will not have a range of attack. And if anything, you have a knight here on h6 in the end game, which controls the dark square complex as well. Unlike the bishop here on b3, which only controls the light squares, you can control both light squares and dark squares. If anything, you're actually just in a winning favor. And for you smart geek who have been wondering for a while, yes, this position, white can play knight to b5, forking the king and the rook again. But the move here really is not to castle on the queen side, where after pawn take on c5, this pawn will be too hard to regain in the future. And what's really just going to bring all these pieces on the queen side, that is with the queen, the knight, the bishop, everybody's just going to go on the queen side, the rook can swing over to the b-file. The c-file can be opened via pawn to c4, the rook can come in as well via d1. There's no reason to suffer in that kind of position, in fact we've already taken the pawn on b2. And so let's just keep on being aggressive by playing pawn to c4. This keep both of the diagonals shut for both the bishop here on e3 and e2. And even after the fork here, we just move our king. As we can see over here, the knight may have taken the rook, but he has no square out. Once the knight moves next turn, we can just simply capture with the pawn or with the king. And even here in this position, we can just play bishop to c2, taking another pawn, attacking the queen. 
the queen has to move, let's say, to c1 or e1, doesn't really matter. If e1, perhaps we can just play bishop to b4 again, just, yeah, just harassing the queen. And if queen to c1, we can just play bishop to a3, just placing more pressure in this position right here. Of course, if the queen takes, we take with the bishop, attacking the rook here on a1, the rook will not have a good square to move to. In general, we have a good position right here for black. And even if white tries to be creative with knight to e1, we can always just trade on c1. If the bishop takes, we simply take. This kind of position would be so good for black. If bishop to b2, rook to b1, pawn c3, let's say. There's no way that black can lose his position as well. Knight to e7 becomes the next plan. Rook to a8, gaining the knight back is also just very good. And so, okay, I think we've pretty much covered everything that we want to cover about. If there's any line that I've missed, be sure to comment down below. In the next review video, we're also going to talk about what if one plays knight to b5 right here, directly forking here on c7. That is also a very possible move, but that will be left for another video. But as usual, if you like this video, please press the like button and also comment down below if this type of opening is actually for you or you hate this kind of opening or perhaps you've played this kind of opening before in the past and you've gotten a good result. I'm eager to know. But otherwise, thanks for watching. See you soon.